Well, I have, so you can see from me wandering up here, uh, there's very little physical upside to getting older. Um, however, be that as it may, hopefully you compensate at least for a little wisdom and a little experience. Um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight because the, this session is the logical conclusion and the logical new beginning of several years of effort that issued in one of the great triumphs of citizen activism in the United States, the ban on fracking in the state of New York. This ban on fracking is also effectively extended to the eastern portion of Pennsylvania in the Delaware River Basin, where we also hope to make it permanent and we also have to have some ripple effect on fracking in Pennsylvania. But fracking has to be seen, and that's why I was pleased to see the pamphlet on global warming out front, as part of a larger issue. Um, we're basically poisoning our own planet. We're doing it for reasons that are rooted in history, and in history, fossil fuel is a good thing. We cannot deny that fossil fuel created the world we live in here. The luxury, the technicals, the tools, the things we take. It was fossil fuel that gave us the energy to build this world. But now fossil fuels costs, its byproducts, are, are larger than its benefits. And given that we have an alternative to fossil fuel, it's time to go there. Now, the Reverend mentioned some of the resistance that is taking place. Fossil fuel is, a, in globally, is a $10 trillion industry. Um, the people who basically control and make money and have power and prestige from that $10 trillion a year are not planning to go quietly. In the part of the West where I grew up, um, when you walked into a bar and you had some people kind of give you kind of what you used to call the come hither look, you would have to make a fast decision as to whether or not you wanted to leave or whether you could carry them out. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a choice. Fossil fuel has got to be carried out. And it's the same thing that banned fracking is the same thing that's going to get fossil fuel carried out of our culture, that is citizens like yourself and citizen action. It's going to be a lot of small choices uh, that are going to accumulate, that are going to overcome the institutional resistance. It's going to be kind of the choices you're going to hear about tonight. Um, Rachel Carson once said that she believed in nuclear power. We had a perfect solar react nuclear reactor 93 miles away, power for free, perfectly situated, no safety issues. It would last for five and a half billion years. Wind is also another form of solar power. There's geothermal, there's tidal power. All of these things are coming online. All of these things are being resisted by the status quo. I am not one of the people who think that an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050 is the goal we want. First of all, that 20% left over will still be $2 trillion, a $2 trillion a year energy. $2 trillion is too much money to leave in the hands of the fossil fuel industry. They're going to try and expand that portion because they have the, the fossil fuel. As the Reverend observed, it has to be left in the ground. We need to essentially set our sights in a course that will eliminate fossil fuel um, from our future. And we can't wait for 2050 to do that. If you live in California, if you live in Miami, if you live in uh, the Arctic, if you live in the Antarctic, um, you can see right now the implications of global warming for us. And, this, and for this, we've only gotten started. Worldwide global temperatures have risen maybe uh, one and a half degrees Fahrenheit in the last 150 years. They could go up six degrees Fahrenheit in the next 150 years. Um, the estimated ocean rise by 2100, which is about uh, the lifespan of my new granddaughter, uh, is four feet. Four, one quarter of New York City is under four feet in terms of zone A. Um, Miami Beach, the highest place, is five feet. Um, places like Norfolk, Virginia are already be seeing the impacts of global warming. We cannot afford to wait. We cannot afford to wait for some perfect plan. We must all take individual steps. So I'm going to introduce you now to three people who are going to show you some of those individual steps that are available for you to take. Our first speaker is going to be Chris Needle, who's a founding staff member of Solar One. 
He will discuss uh, innovative community solar initiatives. Solar, there it is, the sun, we're for it. Um, Idian Quinn, Education Administrative Coordinator at Sims Municipal Recycling, is gonna talk about the role that kind of activity has to play in the future we are trying to create. And lastly, Jeff Irwin, um, who's the Solar Ombudsman for Sustainable CUNY, um, is gonna to speak to you as well. Now, this is important information. What makes it the most important thing is that there is still a great intuitive belief in this country that we can't power what we've got with solar energy. Um, you talk to people in the electric utility business, you talk to people in the fossil fuel industry, they give you a lot of techno babble about how, well, maybe we'll get 5% by 2030, or maybe we'll get 8% or 10%, this is actually errant nonsense. We can, do, we can do far better than that. Um, I want to give, some of you may have heard my discussion of what the United States did in World War II, starting from essentially ground zero. This is, a, this is a great and powerful economy with a great deal of money. If we want to, we can get to a non-solar world, a non-fossil fuel world in the next 20 years, and we desperately need to want to. So without further ado, Chris.